Okay. All right. Ukraine, 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 more Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> things, things directly related to the offensive in Ukraine. Um, else. Yeah, that's the episode today. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>I don't know.
helping the, the LPR capture, you know, ground for themselves, which, you know, makes sense because they don't see themselves as, I mean, they're on the same side, but not part of the same, not, quote, not unquote, the same team. Yeah. They're on the same side, not on the same team. Yeah, that's a great way. I think that's a good. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have a common enemy, but they themselves aren't friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just waiting for the infighting to start, but that that we'll see what happens then. I mean, I, I think at this point the the big thing is that you know the DPR, um, depending on what the Russians decide to do with Mariupol. I know. I I literally just put if. To contextualize when we're recording this, and I, I always love doing this, I put out a thread about 30 minutes ago um, about what the Russians intended to do with Zaporizhia, uh, which I murdered that name. I am so sorry, um, <laughs> my Ukrainian followers. Um, but uh, what they wanted to do to that oblast. And um, at this point, it, it does seem like the language that they're using, the language that I've seen on Russian Telegram channels, the language that I've seen in Russian media, um, you know, uh, the language that I've seen them using really looks like they intend to uh, take or control or sort of establish some sort of, not even a separatist presence, because again, in that uh, in that area, there's just separatist presence. Yeah. Um but they really want to retain that land bridge to Crimea um, and they want to re retain that coastal access to the, um, to the Sea of Azov. So, you know, re retain Mariupol, re um, retain Melitopol. Um, uh, and then, of course, over in Kyrgyzstan, they really want to retain control over the Crimean Canal, um, which I'm just going to throw up a, a map of what that looks like on screen here. But... Um, that runs sort of uh, from Novokakova down to the Crimean border. Um, and I, I, good Lord, I talked about that a year ago. I actually think I talked about it at length on the podcast um, back then. But uh, I think at the time, and I'll just contextualize my thinking a bit here additionally, um, I thought that any Russian invasion of Ukraine would be, you know, a bit more contained. Because, you know, when I was thinking back then, I was thinking, you know, well, in order to do a full-scale, you know, invasion of Ukraine, you know, take Kiev, take everything, the Russians would need to generate a massive amount of manpower. Like, I just, I didn't think they would be able to generate. Um, and so I thought, you know, any interdiction will, you know, probably be 100,000-ish troops. I think we were all sort of looking at that number of, you know, a lot of VDV, some other units, probably a lot of Spetsnaz, other special forces, and they'll, you know, take the south of the country. You know, they'll, they'll take Kyrgyzstan. Take you know Zaporizhia so Oblast. There they'll you know take some actions and the the you know solidify the LPR and DPR. Um, I don't think anyone thought that they would really try to take Kiev. Or correction, I don't think anyone thought it would be that real because of the you have to generate to do it. Um, and I I think that played out pretty accurately. Yeah, and I I I one hundred percent was in the same boat back in you know January early February. In that I thought if you know I was pretty confident they were going to invade. Um, I was getting less and less confident though as time went on. I was kind of you know peaks and troughs of how confident I was about what you know what what we were seeing on the ground. Um, but yeah, I absolutely you know I don't think there were many people you know like I think we've mentioned on other episodes that actually genuinely believed they would go for for Kiev or um, or really even push that far west. Um, you know, I, I was personally expecting them just to kind of push from um, from the Donetsk region and push across to Kyrgyzstan, like like they have. Um, but I didn't expect them to. I didn't expect any of the pushes on on Kiev or on Kharkiv um, or anything like that, or even the movement from from the Luhansk Oblast. I wasn't expecting any much much of that. I was expecting almost entirely the goal to link up with Crimea. Um, and then use that to go negotiate, you know, further concessions from from Zelensky. So, I I think like the reason Russia are in such a are having such issues at the moment is they overextended massively in the first weeks or the first month of the war, um, and are now kind of playing catch up. And you know, if we look, you know, at the kind of um, you know the offensives they they they, they conducted at the moment in in the east and the hands. The Netsk and the Hanskoblast, um, they're having a lot more success. 
um, when they're kind of moving a lot slower and kind of, you know, going village by village and town by town and just kind of well, yeah, because almost it's... acting like we expected them to, like a lot more competent yeah. than, than we were in like the Kiev offensive and the Kharkiv Using, offensive. We were actually using Russian doctrine, like massed artillery fire to, you know, saturate an area before moving in. Yeah. <laughs> an absolute shock. The Russians actually following their own doctrine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think once the Russians started massing troops, sort of, once we saw that action in Belarus, um, in January mm -hmm. and February, um, and, you know, we saw independent researchers figuring out that the Russians were massing a large number, setting up field hospitals in the area, um, I think there was the assumption that they would, you know, maybe make a push at Kiev, um, but, I, I, Really, I, I think it all came down to that first night or that first, you know, day um, where Russian forces, you know, failed to take Hostomel Airport in any significant numbers that allowed them to land further. Um, I, I really think the war, honestly, and, and, you know, I may be completely wrong. This this take may be, you know, completely outdated in a few weeks, but I think the war was really decided within the first 24 hours um, when they failed to take Hostomel Um because at that point, the Ukrainians were able to generate their own. They were able to organize things. I think we saw in that in that first 72 hours, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, militias had been raised in Kiev. And, and it just it, it looked like any Russian push into the city would just be ugly. Um, and they really weren't able to generate the infrastructure to, um, uh, uh, to move in that direction. And then the Ukrainians went further and they, you know, they they flooded the Urban River. They um, just took these actions to uh, secure route to Chernihiv. Um I just I really think the Russian failure to secure a quick victory in Kiev absolutely damaged their ability to their their long term prospects in the country or wider prospects. You know they they weren't able to force Zelensky out. Zelensky, you know very publicly stayed in Kiev. You know, they tried to kill Zelensky. They weren't able to do that. Um, I, I just, I really think that first four hours was a failure and has really colored the entire war. Yeah, and I, I think I've said it before in previous episodes, and you know, I'm still standing by that. If Russia, from day one, did focus, again, like, in on the Donbass region... Get the Lambridge, Crimea, and you know, just take the rest of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. The war would be over weeks ago. Weeks ago, the war would have been over. They, they would have taken the Oblast. Zelensky would have sued for peace. Putin would have been happy. He'd have his buffer zone between Ukraine again and you know NATO. Um, or, or if Ukraine did join NATO, you know he'd have his buffer. Um, oh, well, and, I, and I, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess it would have been over weeks ago. Yeah, if, I, I you think know, that if they. Russia Optimistic, not optimistic, but ambitious, should we say? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if they if they manage to take Hostomel Airport in the first twenty four hours of the war, if if that first landing was actually successful, and there there were IL seventy sixes full of VDV units ready to land at Hostomel, I, I think mm -hmm. the war would have gone far far differently. Um, if yeah, because I can remember able... seeing yeah, there's videos of you know like troops on like the outskirts of like the city right here of like. Fight, firing across the river, they, you know they were they were very very close to entering no, the city. No, it's, and it's kind the of... first. The I think it was the first or the second night. Um, Russian troops who were at Hostomel might have gotten lost or something, but they made a a, a, a whatever the heck it was a thunder run down the M O six, um, mm -hmm. into and they because I remember there was there was fighting by the by the zoo in the western part of the city. Um, I yeah, that's where right, the metro yeah. station was. Um. So at that point, there really were no front lines. Everything was very fluid, and the Russians could have, if they had the forces on the ground, which they didn't, they could have pushed into the city in a much easier manner. Or the Ukrainians had actually gotten their lines sorted out before they had gotten, you know, militias raised in the city. Um, but after that that period, I mean, everyone saw what the citizens of you know, Kiev were doing. It, it was <laughs> not going to be a pretty picture. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think the, the moment that did it for me was seeing, um, uh, I think it was day two, maybe day three, that there was a freaking 2S7 
driving around the streets of Kiev with I I, I it might have been TDF fighters with it might have been um those uh, uh territorial defense force um but yeah. they 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 were ready to fire that thing once at a Russian you know at, at a Russian formation and cause havoc um yeah I think I that I think that really you know demonstrated what the first few days were about in Kiev. Yeah, and uh, of course, like, whilst things were going horrific for them around Kiev, right, in the north, like, in the south, it was almost a complete opposite story, right? I mean, they've had, I mean, they've they pretty much succeeded in, in I, I would say, most, if not all, of, well, obviously, we think they've got, they were going to try and take Odessa as well, obviously, they never got that far. Um, but they got damn close to um, Mikhailov, um, and if they'd taken that city, then, you know, then Odessa was obviously next, so... You know, in the south, you know, with with Kherson and and like the land bridge to to Crimea, and then linking up with the Donetsk region, um, you know, they they did, you know, they they did very well there, um, and obviously now they're looking to solidify their grasp on that on on that region by was it looking at uh, was it a referendum or some other bullshit <laughs> kind of vote I, that they're yeah, gonna? I, I don't even know if that went people. through. I did not see much news on that or additional news on that. Yeah, but it, it seems like they were considering or at least talking about um, forcing like a referendum on on like regions occupied in the south to be like, oh, you know, do you want to join Russia? Do you want to be Russian? Kind of thing. Um, and we obviously know how well that went in in Crimea when <laughs> like there were multiple multiple videos of ballot stuff in the you know stuff in the ballot box um by you know one right, so guy crimea, so crimea probably had the most russian um sort of allegiance or, or pro-russian sentiment of you know the entire country Ukraine during that 2015 period um yeah cause they took the whole they took the, you know, they took the entirety of crimea without a shot fired you yeah, know they, they, they the commanders probably, in crimea were very pro-russian yeah, the they, as well. they probably could have won the elect the referendum legitimately but it would not have been you know 95 percent or whatever it ended oh god no um, i think it was even higher let me have a look at that let me quickly google that I, um I keep, in my head it's 93 percent, but i keep forgetting um but yeah i mean referendum. at, at the it was 95 end, yeah at at the end yeah. of the day, um, it, it's it, I, these areas north of Crimea who have remained in Ukraine through the entire conflict do not have those same pro Russian opinions or positions. Oh um, no, they will never be able to have a legitimate referendum, especially now. Um, yes, of course, there will always be those collaborators and you know the, the new regional or administrations um especially um i i think there was a statement by um i would i would i would have to go back through this um i i think i i had tweeted out a statement from um one of the regional administrate or new regional administration heads um mm -hmm. russian puppet like very clearly um yeah but he had said um find the uh it's like the last time i actually quoted task which always makes that oh um <laughs> uh uh oh no it was in uh Zephyrsi the oblast um uh after complete liberation ukrainian nationalists will head towards becoming part of russia um uh oh vladimir rogue um uh there's only one future for Zaporizhia's oblast. It should be part of Russia and should become a full-fledged subject of the Russian Federation. We do not need gray zones. We do not need, you know, the Zaporizhia People's Republic. Um, we want to be part of Russia. We have always been for hundreds of years. Um, and, and so, you know, you'll see these people uh, uh, talking about that and, and wanting to, or these people that Russia have installed um, are, yeah. you know, fervent pro-Russian individuals. Um, will want to in that direction. Yeah. No, exactly. And uh, yeah, I again it's not I, I was gonna say, like I'm surprised we haven't seen um 
any kind of real resistance, like armed resistance, um, in these regions. But but again, we don't know. We don't know if that if there is or if there isn't. If there is, but there's not much footage of it. Um, and of course, it's not being talked about much, which you know, it would make sense. Russia would want to keep that quiet, and obviously, maybe you know, the Ukrainian side might want to not to you know publicize it too much again for obvious reasons. Um, but we did see very recently. Um, there was a video filmed by, I believe it was a Chinese news crew, of a Russian tank exploding quite spectacularly. Um, and of course, as standard, you know, the turret being launched many, many feet into the air. Um, and that was geolocated, um, you know, very, very far behind the front lines. Um, and I believe it was speculated at the time that that might have been, you know, partisans or resistance fighters or whatever you'd like to call them. I'm sure Russia would call them terrorists, you know, whichever, whatever side you're on. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, I'm going to kind of completely argue with myself here. Maybe there is, you know, maybe a significant resistance in these regions that we're just not hearing about. Um, and I suppose it is difficult to separate what is the actions of maybe a resistance and what's the actions of just maybe conventional military when the war is still very much very fluid um and front lines you know are moving every day i believe you know like russia and uh, ukraine sorry are currently conducting a counteroffensive towards kirsten um in the last 24 48 hours and have the lines have been uh, very static i haven't seen much on that at the moment there were rumi rumors of a uh, of a river crossing um uh, yeah, I saw today actually, that maybe they gained maybe nine or ten kilometers that Ukraine have pushed towards the city. Uh, there was there was a rumor know. of the of a river crossing over the I'm forgetting the name of the river. Um, the uh, that's the smaller river in uh, uh, Kirsten Oblast. Um, uh, isn't it all just part of the you know Dnieper? No, no, no. It's it's a it's a different river. I I, I let me. Let me actually pull the map up here because I, I use I use live UA map for order references actually pulling it, but it doesn't river names. Um Yeah, but, I'm on just I'm just on live UA map now, I'm just looking. I was yeah, like, Yeah, no, oh, it's um do we get more, but no. <laughs> uh nope. No, not gonna even try to pronounce that one. Um but it's a it's a it's a smaller um it's it's a smaller tributary river. Um, oh, okay, of okay. The, of the Dnipro. Um, that that's it's I don't know thirty miles. Um, uh, so you know it's if they manage to, it would definitely be interesting. I know river crossings during this war have been a a bit of a mess, as as I know you guys have talked about before, and as I think we've all seen. Um, so that that definitely is something to remember. Um. River crossings are, are not always the best option, especially if they're contested by a competent. Yeah. Person. Yeah. Um, again, it really shows that how much Ukraine was, I know it's what we mentioned every time, I think, but it's how much Russia underestimated Ukraine is that we're now over three months into this war and Ukraine still, their air force is still flying and conducting you know multiple sorties a day um oh and 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 not only that but based on the locations based on the combat range of an su-25 flying at low altitude those su-25s are based at air bases very close to the donbass like mm -hmm. we're, we're 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 talking about probably seeing uh uh these aircraft operating out of the um so that's yeah, definitely yeah. something to think yeah, and yes, yeah, so obviously yeah, the air force are, are are active, and you know clearly, you know we've seen multiple videos over the last couple of days, like you said, of the Su twenty five flying very low, very fast. Um, and also, I don't know if you saw the video of them doing the same kind of lobbing of like unguided rockets as we've seen like Russian and Ukrainian helicopters doing, but obviously these were like Su twenty fives doing them. So the, I don't know how far those rockets are going, but I'd guess a hell of a long distance. When these uh, SU twenty fives are doing the same, the same, uh, the same technique, there. Yeah, no one um, wants to get in man pads range. No. Yeah. No. And again, every time I see these videos, I always think it's like such a waste because again, we're not seeing what the um, 
you know, where they're coming down. But there's such a huge spread on the rockets. Like, as soon as they were even fired, there's a massive spread on them. I can't imagine they're coming down anywhere near the target. Um, but I guess that's the whole point of, you know, like IDF, like indirect, you know, fire is that, you know, you're just harassing them constantly. Um, maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe you'll hit a school. I guess that's the, the risk that everyone's kind of running when they, they're doing this, yeah, this they're technique. Granted, but, I, mean, um, I think the imagery that we've seen out of the Russian shelling, insane. It just it yeah. looks like the, the, literally, it's a city that now looks like the surface of the, um, <laughs> Astro yeah. Um, That's the other thing as well. Like, I can't see Russia like Russia aren't going to invest the money to rebuild these towns and cities. They they're just not going to do it. Don't have it. No, exactly. It's just so, they don't have the money. So like, surely like they're going to have to withdraw at some point because they're not. What, what's the point in just holding rubble? Which is what it is. You know, unfortunately, that's what it is. In all these towns. Is especially like Lyman, like you mentioned, like the, the high res satellite imagery, which I can't remember if it was Maxar or Planet that released it um, the other day. But again, like you said, it was just, you know, especially on the edges of the town, there was just no buildings left and it was just completely oh, yeah, crazy. I mean, we saw videos a few days ago released Maxar imagery. It was, you know, the Russians using, using Toss Ones firing into the center of the town. Oh, shit, like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, had, I had posted some of those videos, and it was very clear what the Russian strategy was. Level the town if we have to. Which is, again, one of the major reasons why the Ukrainians were free from the area. It was... Yeah, and, you know, it's... There's such different wars, I hate, like, bringing it up, but it is very Syria. And all, you know, pretty much exactly what Assad did in Syria was... You know, and Russia, and you know, obviously with Russian help, they would just completely destroy these towns and cities and make them unlivable. Yeah, I mean, Assad so, could only hope leave. to have Assad could only hope to have that quantity of mass rocket artillery fire in one. Place. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, look at everyone knows what Syria looks like. So obviously, you know, you know, they. It's yeah. It's just. <sighs> Where I I think everyone is very lucky that the Russians were ever able to really competently um, get their supply lines sorted out in, you know, around uh, Kiev, Kharkiv, or Cherny. Mm -hmm. They were never able, able to get their supply lines sorted enough to do that same level of mass rocket artillery fire into them. Yes, the cities, yeah. all three of those cities were hit very heavily by that fire, but they weren't, they didn't see the same level of destruction as I think we're going to see it ever done yet at school. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, but it's just frustrating to watch because it's... Again, I, I know we're sending weapons, a lot of countries are sending weapons and, and ammunition and, and aid and stuff, but it's still... It doesn't stop it happening. Does it, you know, like Russia is still... They're still going to, you know, raise these cities to the ground and then, you know, we'll have to build up... You know, they're going to have to get built back up again, but... Is if only there was a way to kind of stop stop it happening before it happened. I think that would be the way to do it. And I, and I guess the, the obvious solution would have been admitting Ukraine to NATO three or four years ago. That would have stopped this whole thing from happening. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm I'm I am genuinely unsure if that would have stopped Russia. Like I I I, 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 I don't know. I I really really don't know if that would have stopped Russia. I don't think Russia wants a fight with NATO. As as much as I'd love to claim on like you know, Russia Today and, and, and on their state TV that, you know, they could absolutely beat NATO in a fight. Um I, I don't know if anyone with any knowledge of the armed forces actually believed that. Um and and I think we we've mentioned before, you know, that, that kind of live security meeting, security council meeting that Putin did, um was it maybe a day or two days before the invasion, or maybe even a week? It was when they recognized the Donetsk and Luhansk republics. Um, and I believe it was Lavrov at the time who, out of all of his kind of you know, senior advisors, seemed very unsure about the whole thing and seemed very hesitant to um, kind of lend his support to it. Um, and at the time, I kind of, you know, I think some people kind of suggested that maybe he's grown a conscience. Um, but I think now it's probably that he knew how bad, how badly, you know, the state the military was in. Um, 
and probably just didn't expect it to go well. Uh, because, you know, Lavrov spent his career kind of justifying what they were doing in Syria, so I doubt he's going to grow a conscience over, you know, anything they do in Ukraine. Um, but, yeah, it's... Yeah, I, I can't imagine that Russia would have been that keen about rushing into a war with NATO. Or they would have. Um, and things would be a lot worse now. So it's 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 very difficult to say one way or the other, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... I think Russia was, because again, this is this is an unforced error by Russia, and I think at this point we can mm. pretty clearly call it an error. Um, oh yeah, just from their military losses alone. Um, but I mean, say say at this point, you know, they take Severodonetsk, they you know, close or perhaps manage to close whatever pocket that is there. Um, what really is there? Next move. What what can they do? I mean, the Ukrainians have pushed them back from Kharkiv, um, or Kharkiv, whatever flavor of calling it is. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, yeah, sure. They've they've set up defensive. They the the Russians have had to set up defensive lines on um, again, yeah, what river is? I or on on the uh Donetsk River. Um that's <clears throat> that's the, the Russians are going to be are going to have to make a crossing of the again. Um yeah. uh, well, correction, they're 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 if they want to make any offensives uh up by uh Byman, up by up by Izum, up by that area, they're they're going to have to probably try to make another crossing the um, because the Ukrainians are going to attempt to, you know, destroy their already established bridging attempts. But there, there is a pretty big question there of, you know, what they're going to, um, what they're going to manage to do in the area. Yeah, and I, I mean, even even if they manage to close the pocket around Severodonetsk, um, you know, which which you know, I, if I had to stake money on it. I think they will manage it just based on like the kind of steady progress they're making. Um, just looking on like live UA map right now, they kind of close the pocket. They need um, they, they have slowed... kind of major towns between I... closing the pocket, and it's only about. 12 I don't think they'll be able to collapse the pocket. Um, no, no. The, the Ukrainians, if they close the pocket, it's probably because the Ukrainians are going to root. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, what I've looked at, uh, you know, at P P Asna. Uh, Anna, or I'm gonna butcher it every time. Just I think you were um, right the first time. I think it's Pop Pop Asna. Pop Asna? Oh Asna, God, yeah. I don't. I'm it's gonna... AS. It's AS, not yeah. SA. <laughs> um, but in in that area, um, they've taken the high ground. I, I know a lot of people have talked about this. I'm sorry for contributing, but they have taken the high ground. But they've really <laughs> had trouble moving off of it. They've obviously used it to shell Ukrainian positions, to shell Ukrainian supply lines. Um. Mm -hmm. But they really haven't made the greatest progress moving off and down into the low. Um, and so we'll see, sort of see how that evolves. Um, but at the moment, sort of the Ukrainians have kept those lines open. Um, it is really a question of how much longer they'll be able to do that. Um, with the amount of shelling and, and the amount of, of offensive efforts that the Russians have taken. Um, but uh, again, that, that's a... That's a that would be a, a small regional victory. Not talking about you know a, a massive victory. I mean, even if they like, again, even if even if okay, even if they like, close the pocket, and even if they manage to collapse the pocket, you know, Putin before the war again, he recognized um, the Donetsk and Hans republics, including the entirety of the borders of those oblasts. So, from where Russia are at the moment, in um, you know, like, again. At Popasna, um, get to the border of the Luhansk region, they would have to move west another 112 kilometers through some major cities of like Kramatorsk and Slovyansk, which you know it's it's not going to be easy by any stretch. I mean, Slovyansk itself is on a river, um, and I know, I know the Russians want more. to mobilize additional force just around of conscription, you know, yeah, they're going to be able to probably by the end of the summer, but guess who's mm -hmm. also mobilizing large numbers of forces? Yeah, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's 
clear that they've depleted their stocks of usable, um, quote unquote, modern equipment at the moment. Um, I don't think we're ever going to see, what is it, the uh, T 14, the Armata? I don't think we're going to see any of them in Ukraine because, as far as I'm aware, they have nine maybe total that are running functional. Um, a little bit more. Uh, and even at the recent like Victory Day parade, I mean, like the, the most recent one, like in in May, so you know weeks ago, I believe they showed four at the start of the parade, and then only three of them actually made it, you know, into the parade because one broke down again um, from the reports I read. So I think the risk is much higher for Russia to kind of kind of throw them into Ukraine. Um, because the propaganda victory that Ukraine would have if they managed to destroy or capture one of those will be much, much more than any kind of advantage it's going to give to Russia to actually, you know, risk using it. I mean, it's still a tank, right? It's still probably going to get destroyed by some anti-tank weaponry that was designed in the 60s, you know, for, for the most part. Um, so I think it makes much more sense for Russia to not even try to use it in Ukraine at the moment. And except for maybe some kind of, you know, victory lap around Mariupol, maybe. You know, that's maybe where we'll own the only time we'll see it. Um, yeah, but yeah, like you said, you know, like Russia has thrown a bunch of old stuff out of, out of uh, storage. And even prior to the war, um, you know, some of like, the artillery that was getting pulled out was, was very old. Uh, so, you know, it seems like even prior to the war even starting, they had some issues with, you know, um, more modern equipment being, you know, combat ready. Yeah, I mean, I, I I know we saw them pulling out, you know, OTR-21 Tokchas, um, which they claimed they weren't, but it was pretty damn clear that they did. Um, and, you know, their units already in by the DPR and LPR. That that was a whole thing that was debunked pretty easily. Um, but, you know, I, I... Again, a lot of these units... Um, I forget who it was, but someone did a very good analysis of... Um, how many tanks they actually probably have in storage, and mm -hmm. the, the numbers in hot storage or or the most ready storage weren't great, um, and probably weren't the units. And again, a lot of these tanks have not gone under any sort of modernization. You know, they're gonna slap some ERA on them possibly in the next few months and call it, you know, a done job. But the difference between that and you know the tanks like the T seventy two M one coming from Poland. Um, those were already modernized with thermal sites, enhanced fire control computers, all that stuff. And then the Ukrainians slapped some, you know, ERA on. But under the the underlying harder modernizations that you know that enhanced fire control equipment had already been modernized by. Um, so that is one advantage that the had. Um, sort of in that area where the the Russians are fielding these vehicles, but between international sanctions and unless they. You know, continue to yeah. I was gonna say, should, should we briefly or speaking of you know, like not great situation, should we very briefly touch on possible uh, Turkish yeah. action in Syria before? Yeah. Not not great right. situations that are also kind of related to uh, you. Yeah, so I mean, over the last what was it maybe week or so, maybe week ten days, there have been rumors, rumblings, threats from Turkey that. Um, they're going to launch another offensive into northern Syria to kind of carve out what they call a safe zone. Um, they aim for it to be uh, 30 kilometers deep from the northern Turkish border. Um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume most people know that Turkey controls some areas already, but just in case, obviously, you know, Turkey currently controls... Um, you know, the Afrin region, which they invaded back in 20... You have to help me out here. I, I want to say 2017, maybe? No, the um... last major offensive was 19, I think. No, but Afrin was the first one, right? Oh, it was uh... 18. 2018, January 8, 2018. I'm going to count that as 2017. That's close enough. Um, yeah, so yeah, so they did... Yeah, yeah, so you're right. They did 2018 into Afrin. Um, and then I believe 2019, they did... Um, a further offensive, a little bit further to the west, east. Sorry. Yeah, twenty nineteen um, was a much wider range. Yeah. Of military action. 
Yeah, so they, they've been kind of taking piece by piece of kind of Kurdish areas in northern Syria, um, which they claim, you know, is harboring terrorists and they were a threat to Turkey and yada, yada, yada. Most of which is, you know, pretty, pretty bullshit. You know, I mean, obviously there are PKK in northern Syria, no one's doubting that. Um, but for the most part, you know, the, the, we, we're not seeing. Um, you know, any kind of like widespread attacks into Turkey using northern Syria as a base. For the most part, they're just trying to give on themselves and get on with their lives after a decade long horrible you know, civil war, um, which has killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but, you know, uh, Turkey have been invading, um, pushing these kind of Kurdish groups out of regions of northern Syria and then. Um, I mean, the only word for it, I guess, is kind of ethnically cleansing these areas by pushing Kurds out and bringing um, kind of Arab communities who have been displaced, um, you know, through no fault of their own. They've been displaced through fighting in other areas of Syria. And Turkey is then offering these people a place to live in what were previously kind of Kurdish towns and Kurdish villages um, and, you know, directly changing the demographic of these regions, which, you know, it, it is it is literally ethnically cleansing the, these areas. Um so, of course, you know, Turkey are threatening the same thing again. They want to take the rest of northern Syria, which, yeah, I don't know if you, you can probably check a, another map up, use, you know, the live UA map or the, the Syria map, which is a great one. Um, it's, a, again, a huge chunk of land which they aim to capture, um, least of which, of course, is Kobani, which was the scene of um, a long siege by ISIS, um, in again, the year is gonna. The year's gone. It's, it wasn't twenty fifteen. I don't think I'm gonna say uh, twenty six. Oh, uh, no, Kamani was uh, fourteen. Fourteen. I forgot. Yeah. I'm, go I'm way off. Yeah, most of those initial offensive were fifteen. That that summer, yeah, it was 14, summer. The summer of twenty fourteen was a bad one. Um, yeah, that was. Uh, uh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, of course, that was very famous. Um, you know, the, the U.S. were carry, carry, um, conducting multiple, multiple airstrikes. I say multiple is a massive understatement. It was constant airstrikes, um, and it was incredible because, of course, all these Western news agencies literally set up on the Turkish border. Um, you know, hundreds of meters from the fighting, and just set up live streams, and you could just watch these, um, you know, U.S. airstrikes kind of just pummel the town and pummel these ISIS positions. Uh, the most famous of which I remember there was like a a, a hill uh, around the city in which ISIS kind of raised like a huge black ISIS flag um, and the US bombed the absolute hell out of, <laughs> out of the hill just to prove a point. It was just, they bombed it for a good long while, this flag. Um, I say there probably wasn't much of a flag after the first bomb, but they, they bombed it for a good while. Um, but yeah, and, and I think, again, the most striking thing of that siege was, you know, like the Turkish forces literally sat on the other side of the border and just watched it happen. You know, they, they watched ISIS move into the town, they watched ISIS massacre the Kurds, they, they did, for the most part, nothing. They sealed the border to stop people fleeing the fighting. Um, you know, the, the history between uh, Turkey and Kurdish people is very long, very complicated. And uh, not something I think we need to get into right now. Maybe maybe one day we can get into that one. Um, presumably we will if and when this offensive does start. Hopefully not, of course. Uh, but yeah, so obviously there's a lot of, to put it mildly, a lot of bad blood between uh, Turkey and the Kurdish people of northern Syria. Um, so, you know, Turkey is planning, or allegedly planning... Um, I say allegedly, it was you know it was it was the president himself that said that they're gonna they're gonna carry out this operation, um, but they said the same thing back in I did have a look before this podcast. It was back in November last year. Um, they were threatening the exact same thing, um, and there were a lot more warning signs at the time. There were you know there was movement of the um, the Turkish militias in northern Syria, um, the. Syrian National Army, I believe they call themselves. Um, or is that the ones in Idlib? Idlib? Um, nope, nope, it is the Syrian National Army. So yeah, Syrian National Army, or SNA, um, or they're also informally called the 
TFSA, which is the Turkish backed yeah. Free Syrian Army. And the TFSA um, is made up of also a lot of militias and they imported over from uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah. And the, the TFSA, SNA, they are constantly fighting and with the Kurdish groups in northern Syria. Um, I mean, even today, if I look again using like, the Live UA map, um, you know, they constantly, you know, artillery mortar fire between, you know, like Kurdish and Turk and, um, you know, like, and militia areas. Um, yeah, and, and occasionally the fighting will get worse and then it'll kind of it'll be a lull for a bit. Um, I believe recently there was a couple of Turkish drone strikes which assassinated some kind of Kurdish commanders. Um, yeah, but there hasn't been a whole lot of movement of huge kind of mobilization um obviously nothing close to what we would have seen from you know russia ahead of ukraine but you'd expect something if turkey were planning an offensive um i saw maybe yesterday or maybe the day before there were some reports that turkey had moved 50 tanks and some artillery into similar areas in in northern syria already kind of turkish held areas um i didn't see any kind of photos or videos to collaborate that but um, or corroborate, sorry, not collaborate, that's a different thing entirely. entirely. Um, but there are, there's, there's rumours and whispers and claims that, you know, there are movement. I believe the Turkish Minister of Defence did visit the border quite recently. Um, and I remember they did also do that ahead of uh, previous offensives. Again, correlation isn't always causation, I guess, but, you know, it, it's it's another sign to look out for. So it looks like things might be in moving. I think if they are, they're in very early stages. I don't think we're expecting to see an offensive in, in the next, you know, days or weeks. Um, but yeah, it seems like things are starting to move quite slowly. Yeah, um, as as I've commented, I, I don't think I've seen the activity really between... I would expect the Turkish to do a similar... The Turks to do a similar thing that they did in um, uh, uh, back during the last offensive in 2019 um where they would uh force over from libya um we saw a lot of chartered flights we saw passenger flights huh, randomly going from turkey to libya and back repeatedly um and i haven't seen that yet so no. if we do it'll be a, an absolute sign that they're intending to do something. um but until then i don't know yeah and again again obviously we Hopefully it doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, there's no again, like I said, there's, there's no real signs at the moment that it is imminent. Um, I don't know when the next kind of Turkish election is. Um, I'm going to quickly Google that. It could be uh, 2023. So you know, it could. You know, there's an election next year. So this could all be just you know bluster ahead of an election. Um, or it could be they might try and actually try and get some tangible gains ahead of an election as well, is the sort of flip side of that. Uh, so it, it's difficult to say at the moment. At the moment, again, like I said, like, I'm expecting it to happen, um, and I have been expecting it to happen for a little while, simply because, you know, I, I don't think Turkey going to leave something kind of unfinished. You know, they've always been claiming that they're trying to, you know, defend the border and make the border safe. Um, and there are huge kind of chunks of the border which are completely, you know, they they controlled entirely by the Kurdish um, SDF um, or as they call them, you know, PKK, you know, the YPGR, um, the the largest kind of faction in the SDF. And we're going to have to start explaining these acronyms, I think, <laughs> if this goes on, because yeah. if Syria has, if there's one thing, still make a guide on screen. Before, yeah, it is. There are a hell of a lot of acronyms in Syria with, um, you know, just, just the groups, you know, like the, the uh, SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, there, there are, you know, dozens of individual groups that make up that, that um, you know, alliance. I don't even know what you call it. Um, and the same with, you know, the Syrian National Army, the Turkish groups. There are, again, dozens of groups, most of which are more focused on killing each other than killing Kurds at the moment, luckily. Um, constant infighting in, you know, kind of Turkish areas. Um, so, if they can stop them, if, you know, if Turkey can get them to stop fighting each other and, you know, fight the Kurds, then 
we might see some movement. But at the moment, like I said, there's, there's nothing imminent. But I think it's something we should we needed to kind of touch on, especially with all the kind of rumors and stuff over the last the last week. And hopefully, then by the time we come out with our next episode in, I don't want to say a date because we're awful at sticking to dates. Um, yeah. Say that. <laughs> Um, but sometime in the next couple of weeks, we should have some some further information on what's going on. Um, and you know, if, if there's nothing, you know, if there's nothing more in the next in the next couple of weeks, we'll make sure to mention that as well in the next episode. That you know, nothing's actually happened. We won't just kind of forget about it. We'll try not to, at least. Um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to um, mention? Oh God. Uh... Is there anything else that we've missed over the last couple of weeks? Any major events? Um... I do expect continuing Russian uh, offensives in Eastern all scale, medium scale actually. I'll put I'll put it like that. Um, offensives in Eastern Ukraine over the next uh, I don't know few weeks. Um, we'll see what happens with Russian mobilization into the near future. Uh, that I expect to continue over the summer. Um. Again, medium scale mobilization, not large scale, not you know, small scale, just medium scale. Um, but mm-hmm. we'll see what's happening there. Um, NATO and you know other Western countries will obviously um, continue to provide aid to Ukraine uh, as Ukraine continues to mobilize and to establish uh, a reasonable offensive or defensive ability um we'll see what happens with rocket artillery systems and additional uh, stuff in that and that's 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 all i'm willing to say that i expect um <laughs> you know without any crackpot theories about um... yeah i think there's one thing that ukraine has taught us is that war is impossible to, <laughs> to predict but you know for the most part um yeah, like, very, very confusing, very difficult. To, to... I, I expect the Russians to continue shelling city. That's that's not a surprise. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's something I yeah, yeah. Ru- Russia just continue being absolutely horrific is something we can safe, unfortunately, safely uh, say. And I, again, like I, I don't know how much I believe them, but every so often these kind of you know the. Uh, the "Quote unquote," intercepted phone calls come out that Ukraine push out, and I don't know how genuine they are. Um, and and I I really hope they're fake and faked because the stuff that's said in them by these Russian soldiers is is absolutely horrific. Um, and I think I'm just my brain is just kind of refusing to believe that people are that evil. Uh, but yeah, from what we saw in you know the, the suburbs of Kiev, you know early on that's not always the case i suppose so we'll see how things go over the next couple of weeks but yeah definitely hopefully better hopefully things get better that's that's all that's 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 my prediction things will get better yeah that's that's what everyone hopes all right and on that note i think we will be ending this episode um thank you everyone for listening um we will be back in time in x date that i'll you know adr (laughs) next episode